Um, right. Okay. Beyond the Painted Life, the first talk, Finding the Way. Two pictures to set the scene. First, we have the traditional picture of Mary Ward in her pilgrim hat, and the modern version from Australia. Both, I think, are in character to take us beyond the painted life. We need to do that because the painted life gives us some memorable moments in Mary Ward's life and is a precious gift from the first generation of companions. But it tells us nothing about events after late 1626. And it is a work in honor of our dearest mother of happy memory, to quote Mary Points' other legacy, the brief relation. What is often called a hagiography, namely a writing to show how holy and perfect a person is. Absolutely nothing against that. So we need other aspects of Mary Ward. So it seems worth looking at what else we know about Mary Ward as a controversial figure, pioneer of apostolic religious life for women, a dangerous innovator in the title of one modern biography, or to get the title of the 2010 Jubilee exhibition in Augsburg, A Woman Under Crossfire. Today, I want to begin by looking at what we can learn of her from her own writing, especially the autobiographical fragments. She was, you could say, a reluctant writer. It's only fair to remember that at least once her personal papers were confiscated by church authorities, that from the mid 18th century till 1909, she was not allowed to be known as founder, and there were even orders to destroy all references to her. That certainly happened here in York under Mother Coyne, who went so far as to have her name cut out of books in the library. Even so, much of what we have, letters, retreat notes, and the autobiographical fragments often break off suddenly, and she may have left space on the page, but she never came back to finish. But what we do have is precious and worth studying. We are fortunate today in having the four volumes of contemporary documents collected mainly by Father Joseph Grisard, Imelata, Imelata Vetta, and Henrietta Peters, and prepared for publication by Ursula Wehrmeyer. Here, you have pictures of some useful books. The four volumes of the Ursula collection of documents and Christina Kenworthy Brown's edition of The Brief Relation. And in both of these, you can find the seven fragments written eventually at Father Roger Lee's request before he died in 1615. They're not continuous and were written in different places at different times between Liège 1617 and Vienna 1627. Three are completely undated. They're valuable because in them we have Mary Ward's own thoughts as a mature woman on her earlier self. We learn first that she was a shy, 
diffident child needing affirmation. Many memories show her need to be liked. This may have something to do with the strange circumstances of her childhood in which she was moved around to stay with relations. This slide gives you a map of Yorkshire and you notice the title Child of the Secret People. You'll find this in the exhibition in the Bar Convent in the part which is telling about recusancy and some of the experiences of recusants. That is, those who refuse to give up being Catholics and join the established church. So here we can see York, where probably quite a lot of us are now. Here we have Ripon and Mulwith, where Mary Ward was born and lived only for not quite five years of her life as a small child. And then we have Plowland in Holderness, where she spent time with her right grandparents, that is her mother's parents. And here the most important place of all, Osdeby near Selby, where she was with the Babsorbs. Her earliest memory belongs to Mulwith, the family home near Ripon. This house is actually not the original. If you were at the talk about the painted life a little while ago, you may remember the picture of the fire at Mulwith when Mary was 10, in which she and her little sisters were rescued by her father. This is an 18th century house on the same site, but it does give some idea of probably the size of the original Ward family house. To the right, you get the River Ure, reached from the house a short walk down the field at the back. And no doubt that is very much now as it was when Mary Ward knew it. She remembers playing with a little friend in her father's study while he was working. The other child used swear words, which Mary Ward repeated, trying to show her father that she disapproved of swearing as much as he did. He heard, misunderstood, and promptly smacked her, a thing he'd never done before to any of his children. It's her only recorded memory of early life at home, and it's significant that it's a memory about her father, whom she evidently adored, and whose approval she was always seeking. She never ever seems to say anything about her mother. Then, when she was not quite five, we go to Plowland in Holderness, the home of the Wright grandparents. Again, this house, the modern house, is not what Mary Ward would have known. Certainly, she would have known what has become known as the Plotter's Barn because of John and Christopher Wright, Mary's uncles, later to become involved with Guy Fawkes. This is a building that she might even have played with, played in. She gives a vivid portrait of Ursula Wright, her maternal grandmother, a determined Catholic who'd been 14 years in prison for her faith. Mary slept in her grandmother's room and never remembered waking in the night and not seeing her praying. She remembers offering her own pet chickens to be sent to feed Catholics in prison, only because she wanted her grandmother to be pleased with her. But much of the account of Plowland concerns her mother's sister Alice, probably not more than about six years older than Mary, and her unnamed gentleman companion, whom Mary describes as being light of carriage. Naturally, the little girl was desperately anxious, as little girls are, to be accepted by the big girls, though she could see even then that often they were doing things which were not good. 
All of that you can read about in the first of the autobiographical fragments. But more of the fragments concern the time with the Babthorpes of Osgoodby and Babthorpe, a few miles away, which is evidently where they would have had the farm on which food was produced to feed the largish Osgoodby household. And Mary was there when she was aged 15 to 21. Here we have to the left, a mostly modern Osgoodby house. And here, an 18th century painting of the house that Mary would have known. The modern house from the outside looks very much the same today. The desire for approval evidently persisted while she was there. There's a rather confused account in the second fragment of anxiety over a young man in the house who seems to have had improper designs both on her and on another girl in the household. And of the fact that when the confessor asked her if she knew anything about the young man's behavior, she said no. She says of this time also, I was so desirous to be esteemed and loved by all, that I sought this of everyone, both good and bad. Perhaps she was just being a normal teenager, still she finds it worth recording. But the main influence of her time in the Babthorpe household was on her growth in faith. There is the important and well-known account in the fourth fragment of how the servant Margaret Garrett's story of religious life led to a sense of her own vocation. There's Margaret, and there is Mary being very struck, and there's Barbara Babthorpe, whose turn it isn't yet to think of anything such. Her vocation, is, which is the central topic of the sixth fragment, known as the Italian Vita, which is less vivid than the shorter English pieces, but has much more continuity. She says of her religious vocation at this time, I had no inclination to any order in particular, only I was resolved within myself take the most strict and secluded, thinking, and often saying, that as women did not know how to do good except to themselves, a penuriousness, which I resented enough even then, I would do in earnest what I did. She shows the same thoroughgoing spirit in her devotions until she finds herself driven by them and only finds peace when she decides, I will do these things with love and freedom or leave them alone. Another sign of her growing maturity is in her reaction to opposition to her vocation from family and friends. She prays much and does her best to keep herself in a state of indifference, begging God to do his will. She says nothing of how he brings it about, but goes straight on to her crossing to saint Omer, The town in what is now Northern France was then the Spanish Netherlands, which had become quite a settlement for English Catholics. Here we see the main street, actually, a modern picture of the town in which Mary Ward's first house was in saint -Omer. and when she began her own community later. And here, a view of the river, which was one means of travel from Dunkirk, where she would have had to land with companions. Again, there are two accounts an animated account in the fifth fragment and a fuller version in the Italian Vita, where we have the statement from Father George Keynes at the English Jesuit College. 
two pictures of that side view and then a detail of the entrance door. Father's Father George said that she is expected by the Paul Clares as an extern sister and that this is certainly God's will for her. Her own conviction that her extreme repugnance to this idea can only come from pride, since she is told that the rule is the same as for the choir sisters. And the difference is only that the position offered is more abject and humble. Her representation to Father Keynes and the Port Clare Superior that she feels great suffering and difficulty and their insistence that nevertheless this is God's will. Some months later, she discovers that the community's reputation has suffered because of the bad behavior of the out sisters. The community needs and wants someone who will give good example, especially of chastity, who can be trained to become superior of the externs. And an English lady of good family and virtuous reputation like Mary Ward fits the bill. In fact, there's no thought for her good. The sisters and Father Keynes are simply using her. Because of his insistence that it is God's will, she obeys willingly. But she says, with such aversion and grief, that death by any kind of torment appeared most sweet to me. If so, I could escape from that which nevertheless I believe to be a thing which God will, and in a fitting way, at least with a view to what was to follow. When she discovers the truth, she believes that she must stay until God gives her a definite sign. This comes through the Franciscan priest visitor responsible for the community, who tells her that she must think carefully. Before vows, she is still free to follow another way. But if she makes vows at the end of only one year's noviceship, she will be bound for life. She says nothing, but it comes to her later that there should be an English monastery of Paul Clares. A little while later, her superior, who has been ill, returns and tells her that her place is not as an extern sister, but in the enclosure. Again, she says nothing, but reflects that she has been consistent in following the advice given, but has not been trust treated honestly. A few days later, she leaves the convent. She spent the next two years working on the foundation of a Port Clare community for the English. This was to be at a smaller place called Graveline outside saint omer But the community began in a house in the town with five English sisters from the French-speaking convent and some English candidates including Mary's sister Frances, who was later to become a Carmelite. They all made the spiritual exercises with an English Jesuit, Father Roger Lee, who becomes important in Mary Ward's story because he was her confessor from that time actually until his death in December 1615. So he is a very important influence. Mary was happy in the new community, sure that this was where she was meant to be, until the totally unexpected experience of St. Athanasius's day, the 2nd of May, 1609, when she was sitting silently at work with the other sisters, and she says, they happened to me, a thing of such nature that I knew not and never did how to explain. The sight, intellectually, of what was done and what was to be done in them. 
Here it was shown to me that I was not to be of the order of St. Clair. Some other thing I was to do. What or of what nature I did not see, nor could I guess. Only that it was to be a good thing and what God willed. Father Lee was cautious. She must beware of temptation, pray, do penance and wait. But waiting only confirmed her in her conviction. And in the autumn, when the others were to go to Graveline, she left the community and eventually returned to England, where slightly previously we've already landed in the pictures. In the Italian Vita, she says only that she went with the intention of trying to do good to others and mentions that conversation with her helped various women to follow religious vocations. The brief relation mentions visits to prisons and dressing in servants and mean women's clothes when it helped her purpose. In this case that we see in the picture, walking unobserved through the streets of London with her maid in order to talk to a lady and persuade her about her faith. We knew that it was in lodgings in London near St. Clement Dane's churchyard that the glory vision took place. Remember the time when after a meditation that she feels has been made coldly and ineffectually, She's doing her hair at the mirror and suddenly is overtaken by such an overpowering spiritual experience that she discovers eventually that she has been two hours in this experience. Well, she might have been because in this experience, she learned that she was not to become a Carmelite which had been Father Roger Lee's idea, but that some other thing was determined for her without all comparison more to the glory of God. And so the time goes in which she hears nothing but glory, glory, glory. She returned to saint Omer with companions at the very end of 1609 or early in 1610. These are different pictures of the house in which they first lived. Different close up view, side view, and then the entrance door. Others followed and evidently some children. The annals of the English Jesuits for 1610 speak of the group as certain young English women of birth and excellent education, who heart and soul embrace every opportunity of doing good works required of them at home and abroad, that is, in their own house and outside in the town. Chiefly, the education of English and local children, and of their living an austere life as they sought to discover God's will for them by prayer and penance. From the beginning, spiritual men urged them to adopt some approved rule. But these to Mary seemed not what God would have done. Then she fell ill in 1611 and while recovering, she writes, being alone in some extraordinary repose of mind, I heard distinctly, not by sound of voice, but intellectually understood, these words take the same of the society, both in matter and manner, that only accepted which God by diversity of sex has prohibited. She explains later, in a letter to Father John Gerard, how important this revelation was to her. These are the words whose worth cannot be valued, nor the good they contain too dearly bought. These gave sight where there was none, 
made me know what God would have done, gave strength to suffer what since hath happened, assurance of what is wished for in time to come. And if ever I be worthy to do anything more about the Institute, hither I must come to draw. Now the tension increased. Many of the English Jesuits in Saint-Omer opposed her. And even Father Lee was hesitant, though remained loyal. With our present day experience of women doing so many different things, it's hard for us to imagine how strong the resistance was in the early 17th century to the idea of apostolic religious life for women. But without taking it seriously, we shall not be able to appreciate to the full how remarkable Mary Ward's vision was or how deeply and courageously she suffered for it. Religious women were expected to be enclosed. The Council of Trent, less than a century earlier, had insisted on it. And no one in the church, certainly not the Pope and the clergy, could see any way round that decision. The first surviving attempt at a rule for her community, the Scola Beate Marie by Father Roger Lee, is strongly marked by the assumptions of the time. It's very definitely a compromise document. Yes, it speaks of the needs of England, saying that the companions want to be religious, but also to do services of charity that are impossible in the monastic life. But then it speaks only of the education of girls outside England or in it. In Saint-Omer, though not in England, there is to be strict enclosure and bowers are to be made into the hands of the bishop. There are hints of Jesuit practice, two years of probation before the three bowers, at the time when other religious made one year's novitiate and then moved to solemn binding vows for life. Solemn vows only after seven years. The professed mothers elect the superior who makes decisions after listening to consultants, one of whom has the office of admonitor, which is, you could say, a personal minder for the superior. The group is not to be subject to any order of men. Again, not the same kind of system as with Benedictines, Dominicans, or Clares under the Franciscan men, but they should look to the Society of Jesus for instruction. On the whole, it's a monastic model, certainly not what Mary Ward was looking for. Meanwhile, there was considerable interest, both positive and negative, in what the women were doing. The school in Saint-Omer was flourishing, the community was growing. Bishop Lee is blaze, alas, we have no picture of him, there doesn't seem to be a portrait anywhere, but his name at least is on the list of bishops, and here is the inside of his cathedral. Had known and supported Mary Ward during her work to establish the English Paul Clare community at Graveline, and he saw the English ladies as a help for his diocese. He seems not to have thought at all about the work also going on in England. But we know that Anne Gage was sent to be superior of the English mission in 1614, Susanna Rookwood and Francis Brooksby later. We know there was a house in Spitalfields in 1611 and others at, later, at a later time in London. And we know of Sister Dorothea's work in Suffolk. We know that Mary Ward herself made some four trips to England from Saint-Omer. But should women be doing these things? 
In late 1614 or early 1615, some English Jesuits who were hostile, not to the women, but to the plant Scola Beate Mariae, put certain questions to the Jesuit moral theologian, the Dutchman Leonhard Lessius. The women, they said, follow a certain rule of life, devote themselves to the salvation of their own and their neighbors' souls, especially by the education of English girls. They elect a superior and after two years, take the three simple vows for life. The questions and answers are as follows. First, is this institute allowed and pious? Yes, says Lysias, the aims and means are good. It is not an order in the canonical sense. The work of educating English girls entails the need to travel to England, so enclosure would not be compatible with it. Second, can the bishop approve and confirm it? Yes, he can confirm and approve it in his diocese. Approbation and confirmation of orders as such is reserved to the Pope. Can the Institute be considered a religious state for its members? Yes. The vows ensure them the merits of religious without of religious without canonical belonging to the state. But the women did want to be religious, and Lesius also ignores the pastoral work in England completely. Bishop Blaise's coat of arms, which is maybe more handsome than the name and the entrance to the cathedral. On the 19th of March, 1615, Bishop Blaise wrote an open letter defending the work as a pious institute in his diocese. Evidently, there was tension in saint Omer about the women and what they were doing, so that he felt obliged to make a statement. He speaks of the reason for the institute. Mary Ward and her companions wanted to help their country in a way that could not be done by enclosed religious. They were educating girls and had decided to adopt the rule of the Society of Jesus as far as possible for women. They had presented their rule to him because they did not wish to proceed without the bishop's approval, so that when the time was ripe, everything could be laid before the Pope for confirmation. He says nothing about their work in England, but presents only an educational institute for girls in saint Omer. He lists and dismisses objections to the institute. They have not claimed to be religious sisters. They are not founding mission state stations in England. They are not depriving other communities of members. Since 1610, 49 candidates had entered other communities from among their borders. Their for form of life, furthermore, was no novelty. A Belgian community called the Fille de Saint Agnès lived the same kind of life. In fact, Bishop Blaise was defending the Institute's right to exist as a pious institute for the education of English girls. But evidently, opponents remained unconvinced. Sorry, Pope Paul V has arrived a little bit late, early. The same questions put to Lesius were put to another eminent Jesuit canonist, Francesco Suarez, a Spaniard. His reply, dated the 3rd of June, 1615, dismisses Lesius's arguments. He denied the distinction between an order and a pious institute. 
Religious life is making the three vows and following a rule for a common purpose. The Institute is a new order. As such, it needs papal approval. It is not a reliable state because it's not approved. And without valid vows, it has no permanent status. So there was growing conflict. And in 1616, an English friend of the community, Sir Thomas Sackville, was asked to take a petition to Pope Paul V in Rome on behalf of the English ladies. There is Pope Paul V. The Ratio Instituti, which seems to be the document he took to Rome, appeared after Father Roger Lee's death in December 1615. But the author, who must have been a Jesuit, is not known. After a preamble about the state of England, it speaks of the aim as to promote or procure the salvation of our neighbour by means of the education of girls, and note the next bit, or by any other means that are congruous to the times. That is, Mary Ward is not only and solely founding an order for the running of schools, but any other means that are congruous to the times which will help the neighbor. There is to be a vow to the Pope, no enclosure. Dress is to be conformed to that generally worn by virtuous ladies. There are to be four degrees, novices, assistants, that is lay sisters, mistresses, and the professed. There is a period of tertianship before profession. There is a chief superior who has assistants and the bishop is not to have jurisdiction. By implication, that is, she's looking for an institute which will be eventually answerable only to the Pope. There is specific mention of those working in England. The answer to the petition, written by Cardinal Lancelotti on behalf of the Council of Trent, not, note, written by the Pope himself or in his name, is in the form of a letter to the Bishop of saint Omer. There's no direct reply to Mary Ward and her companions. Lancelotti's letter picks up the point about the teaching of English girls and asks the bishop to be responsible for the chief care and protection of the same virgins, that they may be the more inflamed to religion and produce daily more abundant fruits of their labors. If this happens, the apostolic see will deliberate about confirming their institute. The 1616 petition and Cardinal Lancelotti's letter put Bishop Blaise into a more definite position as protector. The letter, as we have seen, asks him to be responsible for the chief care and protection of the said virgins. There's further document existing as a manuscript in the Vatican Library and known as the Relatio of Bishop Plays, though more probably written by an English Jesuit, since it shows a thorough knowledge of Catholics in England and speaks of the women as living overseas. It comes from May, June, 1616, is addressed to the nuncio in Brussels in the name of Bishop Blaise, and presents yet another plan for the Institute, which would have effectually divided it into two, with members on the continent, living according to the Scola Beatinere, being enclosed and all, members in England doing active apostolic work, and the person of the general superior as the connecting link. Bishop Blaise was certainly supporting Mary Ward and the Companions, 
but perhaps not in an entirely helpful way. We can see 1616 as a turning point for Mary Ward. It's clear that she could have chosen to accept Bishop Blaise's protection and build up her work in Saint-Germain, perhaps even going on to found other schools in the diocese. But that was not taking the same of the society as she had been called to do. This was the moment when she decided to make a second foundation, but not in the Saint-Germain diocese. Perhaps part of the reason was the number of members in Saint-Omer itself. 60 by 1616, and they'd had to buy another house to house all these people, and more coming as a result of the apparent encouragement given by Pope Paul V in the letter to Bishop Blaise. But the choice of Liège in another diocese, a prince bishop under the Wittelsbachs of Bavaria and another nunciature, Cologne, suggests that she felt the need to show that her call was to a wider mission. And the left hand picture shows something of what kind of place Saint Omer was, main city in a valley, and then Note, roads all over the place, up hills. It's quite a taxing place to get around on foot, isn't it? Lots and lots of very hilly walks. So on the 24th of November, 1616, 15 of the English women moved from saint Omer ostensibly to take the waters at Spa, but with a view to making a foundation in Liège. The choice of Liège was probably also influenced by the fact that it had an English Jesuit college. Here is a 17th century picture of what the building eventually turned out to be like, and it has beautiful grounds for the young men to take their exercise in. Modern pictures show something of what it's like today. And at this English Jesuit college were two members, particularly who were friends and supporters. Father John Gerard, alias Thompson, rector since 1615, and Father Henry Moore, the procurator, who had once been confessor to the sisters in saint Omer. Like Bishop Blaise, Father John Gerard certainly wanted to help, and the spiritual ways he did. Apart from the fact that he was Mary Ward's spiritual director, he is also the most likely source for Mary Ward's knowledge of the Formula Instituti, the concise plan of the Institute and the constitutions. In practical ways, his help brought disaster as we shall see. About the beginning of December 1616, the women rented a house on the Mont Saint-Martin, one of those steep hills. That's what it looks like as you see it today from the street. And this, if you can, oh, sorry about that. Uh, uh, now, how to get back. I don't know. So, um, why this one? Yes, behind the house, you go down a very steep hill, and part of this steep hill is the garden. And this is something of what you see. And so, in this house, then, they began their time in the edge. But as time went on, they needed more space, seemingly not only for borders, but also for novices. Here comes the point 
where the financial affairs of the women and of the Jesuits begin to be fatally entangled. Father John Gerard was a brave and resourceful man, a holy man, but not a businessman. He had begun to build a novice ship house in Liège for the English Jesuits in 1615 and got steadily deeper and deeper into debt. By the end of 1620, the debt was 62,600 guilders with an annual interest of nearly 4,000 guilders, which only makes sense to me when I hear that it was a sum sufficient to keep 19 or 20 Jesuits for a whole year. So imagine a big net. In August 1617, Father Burton, who succeeded Father Moore as procurator, wanted to buy a farm as a means of getting cheaper food for the community. Predictably, the Jesuits were already not creditworthy, so they bought under another name, that of the same Sir Thomas Sackville who had taken Mary Ward's petition to Rome. Then, in 1618, Sackville offered to buy a house for the women on the Rue Pierreux. And you can see how very steep this is. Breath, breakneck hill down and then more city at the bottom. And this is something of what maybe had been the house that they bought and steps approaching. But in order to do this, he mortgaged his property. Note, before I say anything else, that Sir Thomas Sackville was in fact the fourth son of the Earl of Dorset, for a time Lord Treasurer of England. He did not inherit his father's presumed financial competence. He mortgaged his property including the farm belonging to the Jesuits. He was expecting to inherit money from England, but it failed to materialize, so he left Liège and left others to pay his debts. By 1620, he was in Louvain, reputed penniless and living on the Jesuits. On the 3rd of April, 1620, he gave up all claim to the properties in Liège in favor of the Jesuits, at the same time, waiving his debts on the Groupierre's house. Father John Gerard of the Jesuits did not accept the waiver. In the course of exceedingly complicated financial and legal dealings, which also included histories of other lendings and borrowings between the women and the Jesuits, Barbara Babthor, superior of the house, was eventually forced to accept the title to all the properties and all the debts. As time went on, this caused desperate poverty for the sisters in the edge, but also for those in Saint-Omer who did their best to help. But it was at least part of the reason why Mary Ward decided that she must go to Rome to seek papal approbation for her institute because it made the financial situation still more acute. There was already a problem because cautious English parents in England, perhaps already hard pressed by recusancy fines, were reluctant to pay dowries to a religious community not officially recognized. What would happen to their daughters if it failed? The difficulty over Sister Praxedes the Belgian lay sister who claimed to have had inspirations from God against Mary Ward's vision for the Institute also showed the need for papal approbation. There's no surviving record of exactly what Praxedes wanted and she had already died. The story that she had called upon God to strike her dead if she was not right 
and that she'd been found dead in her bed the next morning is probably pious exaggeration, but it says something about the atmosphere in the community, how divisions were being created and how her claims were being used by discontented people. Official recognition was becoming a pressing need and Mary wanted to reach Rome while Paul, Pope Paul V was still alive as he had given encouragement. Before she could leave, she had to deal with requests for two more foundations, in Treves and Cologne, which occupied her until the 18th of October, 1621. She needed to accept them as courtesy to Prince Bishop, Prince Bishop Ferdinand and Nuncio Albergati in Cologne. She also sought influential support from Archduchess Clara Isabella Eugenia in Brussels, the Spanish princess who had already helped her over the English Paul Clare Foundation in Gravelin, and whose nephew was the new 16-year-old King of Spain, Philip IV of Spain. Both wrote letters to important people in Rome. Mary herself wrote to Albergati, who was due to return to Rome in August 1621. By then, there was a new Pope, Pope Gregory XV. But at last, by the 21st of October 1621, she was ready to leave for Rome. And concerning the journey and what happened there, and in other places in Italy, we shall see next time.